We're going to be in Matthew 18, and the whole first part of this chapter is about children and our responsibility towards them. But Jesus is used as an example of, of how we should be as Christians. And so, uh, once again, I mean, there's just whew, a lot today. There's a thing that happened in Texas. There's remembering all of those who have lost their lives in our country, fighting for our country, and um, giving the ultimate sacrifice. And uh, so I just want to pray one more time. I mean, we've already prayed for all that, but I just want to pray one more time about all that. Lord, we just do come before you and uh, lift up our country to you, Lord, that a revival would happen in our country. And Lord, that our children would be protected. And we do just commit those families to you, Lord, that you would comfort them in their loss in the only way that you know how, Lord. And uh, so we just commit that whole situation to you and everything, all the aftermath and everything that's happening right now. And Lord, that change would come around in our country, that our children would be protected. And uh, we just also lift up for tomorrow as we remember those who gave their lives. So incredible, Lord. Young men who went out to war for America and gave it all for our sake. And we don't want to forget that. And we want to thank you for their sacrifice. And we thank you for Pastor Jerry being here today and that he made it through that surgery. And the doctor said everything went well. And we just ask you for continued uh, healing on that knee of his, Lord. And that uh, tomorrow or next Sunday, he'd be able to be here back with us teaching the word. We just thank you and praise you for him in Jesus' name. Amen. So I picked this chapter because we're doing a Tuesday night uh, class uh, that Pastor Jerry came up with, a um, discipleship class. And uh, one of the, and it's, it's an open discussion class. And one of the most, uh, should I say, active classes we had was dealing with uh, Matthew 18. And uh, it, was, it was a fun class we had. And a little plug for it is we're, going, we're learning how to be servants of God. And we're going through a Warren's Wearsby book, and he says that uh, ministry happens when divine resources meet human needs through loving channels to the glory of God. And so if you want to find out how completely inadequate you are to be a servant of God and how much you've missed the mark being a servant of God to this date, like we all are, come on out. (laughs) Anyway, that was, sorry. So... (laughs) So we're, we're dealing with division in the church. My actually, actually, first of all, the, the, the title of the message is unity in the church. But the first verse, uh, we're going to see that there's starting to be division in the church. So chapter 18, verse 1, it says, At that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, Who then is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And you might reading that passage right there say, Oh, they're wondering Who's going to be greater, the angels, Archangel Michael? But that's not what they're talking about here. If we go to Luke 9, we'll find out. It explains a little bit more who they're talking about here. Luke 9, 46. Sorry, let me find it. Luke 9, 46 says, Then a dispute arose among them, amongst the disciples. Then a dispute arose among them, as to which of them would be greatest. So now you got the disciples arguing amongst themselves who are going to be greatest in the kingdom of heaven, which is where most division in the church happens. It starts with pride. It starts with somebody thinking they're doing a better job than somebody else, and they need to be a leader somewhere else, and they're not being promoted to a spot that they think maybe they should be promoted to. And it's all about self. And right now the disciples, and this is interesting because Jesus has already given the Sermon on the Mount where he says, let your light so shine before men that they see your good works and glorify who? Your Father in heaven, right? So they they were there for the Sermon on the Mount. They were there for so many other teachings. They were there to see how Jesus poured out love to the multitudes. And yet now they're at a time where they're saying, hey, which one of us with all that we've done, with all that we've given up for you, which one of us is going to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And they're bickering amongst themselves, talking, boasting about themselves and what they've accomplished, which is the opposite of what Jesus calls us to do. And so Jesus, being Jesus, 
Verse 2, then Jesus called the little children to him, set him in the midst of them, and said, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. And so at this time, children were more like at the time when I grew up, children were to be seen and not heard. We were told that as I grew up all the time when my parents had something. It wasn't all about the kids like it is today. Children had their place. We were second-class citizens, and it was be seen and not heard, have respect for your elders, all that sort of thing. Now, how, many, you know, how often are you sitting there in a group of adults and a little kid comes up, interrupts, and the parent stops what they're doing and allows the children to, child to interrupt, right? Things like that. Well, in my day and a lot of our days, uh, we weren't allowed to do that. We weren't allowed to interrupt the adults, and rightfully so, and it gave us a respect for adults. And right now, nobody respects adults. Nobody respects adults. And uh, back when I was in grade school, I got in trouble a lot. And when I got in trouble, um, and the teacher called, my, my parents didn't care what my side of the story was. They didn't care at all. I got in trouble no matter what happened. They didn't even ask me, what did you do? They already knew. And so they backed up the teachers, and they were right to do that. And I remember one time, you're not going to believe this, but my, we're driving in the car, and a little kid runs out in front of the car. Runs out in the front of the car. My dad has to slam on his brakes. He gets out, spanks the little kid, and sets him on the curb. What would happen today if somebody did that? And you say, oh, no. Except that he saved that child's life in saying, hey, don't ever run out in front of a car again. But he would be attacked and he would probably be arrested today if he did that, right? So we've, everything's, everything's out of whack. But here Jesus is saying, become like a little child because at this time, little children had no worth. They hadn't given anything. And so he's saying, so they're going from being these pompous disciples. He's saying, no, you got to be like them. You got to humble yourself to be like them, to be second class citizens. But I also think he was saying, little children also aren't, infected by the world like we are as adults. So little children have blind faith. What do I mean by blind faith? So if they believe in God, they believe in God and circumstances don't affect that belief. They just believe. Where we maybe started off that way and then life takes over and circumstances change what maybe we used to think was an absolute and now all of a sudden our faith starts to wane because we see what man does and put our sights on man rather than keeping focused on God like a little child does. And so he's saying, have blind faith like a little child in me. Right now, remember, they're arguing about who's going to be greatest. So right now, they're all prideful, and they think because of all the work they've done, and he says, no, no, no. Verse 4, therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So he's saying, if your heart's not right, if you don't have the purity of heart like a little child, you'll by no means into the kingdom of heaven. And if you are that way, if your heart is pure, you will be greatest in the kingdom of heaven. What does it mean to have a pure heart like a child? I remember when I was growing up, I mean, I had rebelled against the Lord and I so much so that I felt like, actually, I believed that I was going to hell. But I would still pray at night. I would still say, I believed in God, but I believed he just didn't love me enough for me to go to heaven because of all I had done. And, but I would still pray, Lord, take me back to that place of the rocking horse. When I was a little kid in the rocking horse, and if you said a curse word in front of me, I would, I would go, <gasps> I had such purity of heart. We had such purity of heart as kids, right? And you hear the curse word for the first time, and you're like, <gasps> not out of judgment like we do now that we're older, right? No, you shouldn't use those words. But a kid has purity of heart that it just hurts his soul to hear that right? To hear a curse word or to hear something like that. I'm like, Lord, take me back to that innocent place. And when I got miraculously saved, one night I got miraculously saved, Lord came to me in a vision. The very next day, he answered that prayer the same way I asked it. I went out to a job and someone used a curse word and I was the worst offender of curse words there was. I was working construction. And I, my, overnight, he not only delivered me from cussing, but someone cussed in front of me and I went, <gasps> And it hurt my spirit. And I was like, wow. 
thank you, Lord. And then I knew as adults, if we seek him and he comes into our life and the Holy Spirit is dwelling in us, that he could make us those pure children again with a pure heart. That we could look at others in love, in non-judgment. We could not care about the color of your skin. We could not care about what country you're from. We just love you for who you are. And that's what he wants from us. He wants us to have that purity of heart of little children that we're not out judging the world and we're not out there being prideful in heart and we're there for one another. He's building a bridge here as he gets through the chapter and I don't think we're going to get as far as I'd hope. We're going to see how far we can get, but he's building a bridge of where we have to be so that we can have unity. There's a lot going on in chapter 18 because we'll deal with with, with um, conflict in church, but we can't even deal with conflict in church until Jesus gets our hearts right in the first place. Because if once we get to the, con- well, we'll get there. I'm getting ahead of myself. Okay, let's go. Chapter, or verse uh, five. Whoever receives one little child like this in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believes in me to sin, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depths of the sea. He's saying, if any of us cause a little one to sin. So we have to ask ourselves, how do we cause a little one to sin? Well, if our children come to salvation and we're raising them in the Lord, we have a clean slate with that child. Basically, we can only mess it up. Or we can just let God do his work and raise that child in the way of the Lord. Because that child's pure. He's going to do whatever we ask him to do. But more importantly, he or she is going to do exactly what we do. We should never say to a child, do as I say, not as I do. We should be able to say to every children, child we come in contact with that says, hey, how do I serve the Lord? We should be able to look at that child and say, hey, watch me. If you want to know how to serve the Lord, watch me. And do exactly what I do. That's what Paul said. Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. And you guys might be saying, well, that's kind of a prideful deal to do. It's not prideful at all. Paul also told us about his struggles. He also told us that he, he, he hadn't arrived. He hadn't finished the race. So what Paul meant was, you know, when I mess up and then I go to that person and ask for forgiveness, do that because you're going to mess up. And you know, when I get things wrong and I'm not afraid to say I'm wrong, do that. And you know how I'm content whether I have a lot or I have a little? Do that. That should be all of our goal is to come to the place in our Christian walk, not in pride, but in purity of heart that says, God's made a difference. So young child, follow Christ exactly how I do. Watch my example. Because the child's going to do that no matter what. They're looking at us and doing everything that we do. Have you ever seen a son or a a son walking behind his son and he's step for step just following his dad or a daughter with his mom? It's the most awesome thing, right? It's the most awesome thing if we're leading him in the Lord. But when we lead them astray, it's better to be thrown in the ocean with a millstone around our neck. That's how much God cares about children. And we don't even think about it. You know, there's that saying that says, um, what would Jesus do, right? Right? Well, another saying is, what would you do if there was a four-year-old child sitting right there? Would you do what you just did? Would you say what you just said? Would you talk like you just talked? Would you be watching what you just watched if there was a four-year-old child sitting next to you? Because that four-year-old child's watching everything that you do. It's a huge deal. We know that our country right now, our public schools are stealing our children from Christ. It's just a fact. It's just the fact that they're stealing our children. Satan doesn't have any new game plans. He did it back in Hitler's Germany. Hitler zeroed in on the schools. And he said, if I could change the children, I could change the country. And he changed the children so that when they got older, they had no problem killing innocent Jews. Our country is doing the same right now. They've removed God out of school years ago. And we wonder why these tragedies happen when there's no God in our school. We took God out of our schools. We took the protection of our children out of our schools. The crazy, crazy thing about this, and most of you know this, is they start Congress out with prayer to this day. So the congressmen and the adults, they get prayer, covering of God, 
in their assemblies, but our children, the most vulnerable, can't pray publicly in school. It's just all turned around. And God is saying, we're going to answer for that. Each one of us are going to answer for how the example we set for kids. And so what am I talking about? I'm talking about this. A lot of times in the church, we think a church is to come and just, it's for us. It's for us to be fed so that we could get filled up and feel good about ourselves and leave. But church is for the equipping of the saints, the Bible says. It's for us to come here, be equipped to go out, to set a good examples for children. Not to, so God will, is, is, says he will make a change in our lives. So when we accept Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, we come to church, God starts to change us, who we are. Things get better in our lives. It doesn't mean we start getting Ferraris. That's not what I mean. I mean, things get better in our lives. Whether we're going through a trial or whether we're going through good times, we are content and we have the peace that passes all understanding. And God changes who we are and little kids are looking and going, wow, that's how you serve Jesus Christ? Rather than being those who come to church who are always needy, Am I saying that coming to church needy is wrong? No, it's when it's continual and there is no healing and there is no redemption and there, there is no surrender to where now we're giving out. In other words, the purpose for us being here today is to be equipped to give, not to just to receive, 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 receive. And so he's saying for these children, we have to get to a place where we can say to the children, follow Christ just as I do. And if we're not there, we have to ask ourselves, how have we caused children to stumble? What are some examples of how, by our actions, we've caused children to turn away from the faith? No, I'm really asking. Give me some ideas. What's that? TV. Our little one's sitting there and we're watching a show that no little one, actually, that we shouldn't be watching. And they're sitting there going, well, if dad thinks this is okay, then it must be okay. That's a good example. Yeah. Cell phones. Cell phones. Oh, my goodness gracious. That's a, I didn't even think of that one, and that's a huge one. If our, self, if, if, if our kids want our attention or our kid needs to be trained up and we're always on social media, and do, uh, just a minute, uh, just a minute. How often do you see that today? Children being neglected, and so then they get on their cell phone, and now they're entertained, and they're all messed up, like we heard that guy who preached here about cell phones, right? So our cell phones, huge, huge example that we set that's bad for our children. Yeah. Video games, same. What were you going to say? What? Wait, here's what. Someone remove her. Why would you convict me like that? <laughs> ah, that's a biggie. Absolutely. Well, I'm gonna and I'm gonna tag on to that one. How we react to other people when we're driving. Also, what are we doing? How often do you hear this story? That all the way to church, mom and dad are arguing. They get out of the car and all of a sudden they put on their smiling Christian face. <laughs> oh, everything's beautiful. And the little kids are like, what just happened? <laughs> right? We're not fooling anybody there, right? What were you going to say? <coughs> Music. Absolutely. Oh, yes. Music. All the things of this world that ruin our minds, right? That don't allow us to be those Romans 12, 1 and 2 Christians that are renewing our minds, right? We're actually... Uh, polluting our minds. That's a really good one. Yes. Others. Yes. Drinking. Drinking. All the things, you know, anything that is an actual sin, right? And getting drunk, getting drinking in front of our children, that sort of thing. Absolutely. That's another good one. Yes. Temper. Temper. How we react to things. No question. Are we teaching our children to have a temper? Or I tell you what, my dad had a temper. And man, I had a horrible temper growing up to the point where I had to break something to break me of my temper to where my friends in high school said, whatever you do, don't make... I heard him saying this one time, whatever you do, don't make Brad mad. And I'm like, what is he talking about? I didn't know what he was talking about. But one time we were working on my car 
And I got mad and I took a crowbar and I took it to my car. And he's like, and so, so my dad cured me of my temper because he saw it coming out in me. And I'm not going to tell you what he did because you would turn him in for abuse. <laughs> but it cured me. And so absolutely, because we think about this. Think about this horrible thing. And I know divorce has affected people in this church. And there is forgiveness. But it still doesn't mean we can't talk about it. Think about this, what divorce does to a child. Even if it's of a divorce that happened biblically. What does that do to a child? A child who loves dad, a child who loves mom, they adore us, right? As long as we don't do anything stupid. So they adore their parents. We just lowered the bar for them when it came to divorce. Because when they get older, they say, well, I love my dad, I love my mom, and they got divorced, so it must not be as bad as the Bible says. And so we lower the bar in our children's lives through divorce. 50% of the church has gotten divorced and is continuing to get divorced because we don't simply do what the Word of God says when it comes to divorce. And anybody who says the children will be all right, that is a lie from the pit of hell. Divorce kills children. That's just a fact. And so we need to know that. So young people, it has been tainted and it's been watered down. You need to know it's not acceptable. And don't do it. And anybody here in this church that's done it would tell you the exact same thing. And they've been forgiven of their sins and there is forgiveness. But we still need to talk about it because it destroys children. That's just the fact. And so that's one of the major ways we have been killing children in our country. There's all kinds of other ways we have created now in this day to sin. Like it says in Romans 1.18 that we, were, came from, we, we got to a place of such a depraved mind that we started created way, creating ways of doing sin. And we're there in America right now, right? So many ridiculous things that you never thought you would see on the news that you're going, are you kidding me? A, a regular thinking person could actually do that or say that? And so we're, we're, we're creating those ways. And so our children are suffering because of it. And so we have to change that. Very good, absolutely. And talking about that, respecting your elders. If we don't back up the other elders, and, and that, means, that means we're doing our, our work as parents, right? And we're making sure their coaches are respectable people. We're making sure their teachers are respectable pe people. And if they're not, we're getting them out of that situation. But once we understand that the people that we put them under and they make a decision, we back those people, all right? We don't undercut those people so that our children will disrespect them. Very good. We need to teach our children to respect. No question. Killing babies. <sighs> yeah. No, uh, yeah. That's just, that's just a tragedy, a unspeakable tragedy that we do. And uh, no question about it. Thank you, Kirby, for that one. That's just... Because they're going to find out eventually. And, and uh, anyway, that's, that's just a horrible, horrible thing. Verse 7, woe to the world because of offenses, for offenses must come, but woe to that man by whom the offenses come. And here's what he's saying. You're going to go through struggles. There's going to be offenses. We're going to be around people that tempt us. We're going to be around people who offend us. That's going to happen, he says, but woe to those who bring the offenses. We don't want to be, he's saying, do not be the one that brings the offense, all right, because they're coming, Right? We know we're going to go through trials. We know we're going to go through tribulations. And it's probably be, going to be because of somebody else. An offense that they brought to us. But don't be that one that brings the offense. And, and the definition of this offense is be one who turns somebody away from Christ. Be one who turns somebody away from Christ. Example for us is we go to our workplace and we're the only Christian. Right? And we get made fun of or whatever. Right? But when the other people in the workplace are going, struggling through somebody, through something, what do they always do? They come to you, right? They're going to make fun of you in front of everybody, but then in secret, they're going to come say, hey, I'm dealing with this thing. How do I do it? You want that to change? Do one thing in front of those people that the world does. Start cussing like they do. Go out drinking with them. 
anything like that and you just completely destroyed your witness and now you, be, you have become the offender. You have now turned people from wanting to serve Jesus Christ because they look at our lives and they go, I thought they were a Christian. But the Christians are no different than me. So that's not the answer. And now we've become the offender. And so we have to be very, very careful as Christians to have a heart of a child that cares for the lost. And when we go to our workplace, go, how am I affecting those that I work with? They know I'm a Christian. Do I get there early? Do I work harder than anybody? Do I not complain about my authorities because the people, my boss, because I work for God, not for him? Who am I when I come to work? What example am I representing Christ at my workplace? Or do I show up late? Do I complain about our bosses like the rest of them? Am I a bum because nobody's watching me what I'm doing and I'm, I'm as lazy as the rest of the guys there? What example are we giving to the lost? If we're giving a bad one and we're calling ourselves a Christian, we are now the offender. And Jesus says, woe to the offender. So let's not be the offender. So as you see, he's getting the disciples to a place. He's saying, okay, you guys were just arguing about who's going to be greatest. You were starting to cause division. Now I need you to be like a child. I need you to have a pure heart and mind, okay? And now I need you to set an example. Not so that you are glorified and not so that you get a better place in heaven, but because you care so much for the lost. Because you have this pure heart and mind that cares so much for the lost. He's going to get into that a little, little bit later as we go on. So he says, eight, if your hand or foot causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. It is better for you to enter into life lame or maimed rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into everlasting fire. If anyone tries to tell you there's not a hell, it's right there. And if your eyes, if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. It is better for you to enter life with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire. And so, how big a step are we going to take to make sure that we don't lead children to say all the stuff we just talked about right now? If you're addicted to your phone, are you ready to make that tough decision to take yourself completely off social media and use your phone as a phone? Are you ready to do that for your children's sake? If you're not, you've got to ask, how far am I willing to go? Am I will-? He says, pluck your eye out if it causes you to sin. He says, cut off your hand if it causes you to sin. Does he mean literally do that? If it'll get you into heaven, I say yes. He probably doesn't mean literally, but if it gets you into heaven, cut it off. But we know that even if we pluck out our eyes, we could still lust in our minds, right? So it's probably not talking literally, but again, if you have to move from the neighborhood you're in, move from the neighborhood. If you have to change jobs, change jobs. What is it that is causing you to lead an example and to not have that pure heart? He's saying, cut it off. Go to the extreme, right? Would we all agree that cutting off your arms is an extreme? He's saying go as extreme as you have to so that you can get to heaven. We've got to look at those things in our lives that are causing little ones to sin and take it very serious. Verse 10, Take heed that you do not despise one of these little ones, for I say to you that in heaven their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. And this is where we get that there's guardian angels. It also says in uh, Psalm 91, 11, that the angels will take charge over you. Psalm 34, 7. Let's turn there. That's a really good one. I love Psalm 34. If, if you uh, have never read it and you need encouragement, Psalm 34 is such an amazing, amazing chapter in the Bible. Um, so we're going to read about this angel stuff first, though. Psalm 34. Uh, oh, I'm in Job. <laughs> Sorry. Psalm. Da, 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 da. Okay. Psalm 34, 7. We're going to start in 4, though, so we see what they're talking about. Psalm 34, 4. I sought the Lord, and he heard me and delivered me from my fears. Sorry, wait a minute. 
I got this. Yes. And he delivered me from all fears. They looked to him and were radiant, and their faces were not ashamed. This poor man cried out, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all of his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps all around those who fear him and delivers them. And so another three, three, three verses right there of how, you know, I read one commentator because this is where we say, okay, there are guardian angels and, and children's guardian angels. It says, sees the face of the Lord all the time. But he says, why is it just an angel? It's got an S on the end, meaning there's an army of angels surrounding us. And that's why we pray, Lord, send an army of angels to protect us as we go on this mission trip or we go out into this or we go out into that. It's because of these passages and it's, it's very comforting to know that there's an army, army of angels in the spiritual realm if we will just pray and send them to flight, right? Peggy has her signs everywhere. Prayer changes things. What does prayer change? It sends angels to flight on our behalf. Pretty cool, right? Why don't we want to tap into that? I think we do, so we should start if we haven't. Verse 11. For the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them goes astray, does he not leave the 99 and go to the mountains to seek the one that is straying? And if he should find it, assuredly I say to you, he rejoices more over the sheep than over the 99 that did not go astray. Even so, it is not the will of your Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. So that speaks to this. The 99, let's say the 99 are us, us Christian churchgoers. Are we content with just hanging out with each other? Or is our heart, has our heart come like a little child and has been pure and want to not to cause any offense that we want to go out into the world to save the lost? Where is our heart right now? Man, I love going to church. I love hanging out with the believers. I love Tuesday. I love Wednesday. I love Sunday. Can't wait to be around the believers. Why? To be filled up for ourselves or to be equipped to go find those lost sheep? Where is our heart? A lot of Christians like to come to church because it makes us feel good. And praise God for that. You know, when I, was, when I was raised Catholic, I came to church so that I would go to heaven because I was trying to earn my way. Once I got saved, I couldn't wait to get to church and be around fellow believers. And when I'm not here, when, when I can't make a Sunday traveling or some reason, I feel naked that whole next week. Like I'm, I'm not equipped. Like because I didn't have that covering. I didn't have my, my buddies in faith that sharpened me, that, that gave me strength to go back out into an ungodly world, right? And so that's what church is about. But, but that's not where church stops. That's where it starts. It starts in us coming to be together so that we can go Seek out the lost sheep. Where's our heart? So he doesn't say he doesn't care about us 99. He says the 99 are saved. I want to find the lost. Do we want to find the lost? What are we doing about it? We can say yes, yes, yes. But what are we doing right now to go find the lost sheep? And make sure they have the salvation that we've all been given. Amen? So that's what he's talking about there. He says, now he goes into, so now our hearts are right. Now we're not bickering against one another. And now we care about those that are lost. With that heart, he can go to this. Verse 15. Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. There's four steps to this. 99% of the time, 99% of the time, if you love your brother enough to go to him and not brush it under the rug, it stops there. We talked about this in our class and almost everybody agreed. Yeah, man, when I go talk to a brother at the ranch or when I go talk to a brother in space too, we never have, hardly ever have to go to the overseer because we work it out between us. That's because they love them enough to go to them. See, if I get offended or you, well, I'll say, if you get offended by me and you don't come tell me, you don't love me. You actually become an enabler. An enabler is somebody that tells themselves, well, I just want peace. They get peace, but at what cost? 
at the cost that if I offended you and you don't come tell me, now you're going to tell somebody how I offended you. And now all of a sudden, a cancer is going to start throughout the church. Talking behind my back about something I didn't even know I do. Because an uh, uh, important thing for you to know, I don't have any feelings. So I don't know when I offend people. <laughs> so if I offend you, please come tell me. And hopefully I'll be in that place where I say, Brother, I am so sorry. I, man, I did not mean to do that. And then it's done. And then you brought me back into the fold. Right? But if we don't do that, we leave a brother who's offending people out there to cause more destruction. Do we care for them enough? Do we love them enough? Do we think like little children that says, man, I want that guy back in the fold. So I'm going to go tell him how he offended me and we're going to talk about it. Now, if the brother's in a bad place where he can't hear you, it says then go grab two or three. Here's what it says. It says, but if he will not hear, take with you one or two more that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. Let me back up a little bit about who you choosing your friends as Christians. Do you have friends that will build you up? Do you have friends and buddies that will tell you when you've offended them? A little example for me is we, we had uh, my youngest son's wedding at our house. And, and if you're thinking about having your kid's wedding at your house, don't. <laughs> so we're preparing for this wedding and two months into it and my buddy Johnny Brown comes over. He's coming over every day to help me get the house ready. Get, get, I mean, religiously, he brought coffee and donuts and we started working and so one time I was frustrated because we were putting up this siding and there's a bunch of angles and I, I was pretty frustrated because we were going to have to take a bunch of it down and my wife came out and I don't remember what I said but I snapped at her and she went in the house and so Johnny could have just let it go and said uh, you know what I want peace I don't, I don't want to and but he says to me he goes wasn't her fault I'm like what are you talking about he goes, why did you just talk to your wife that way? It wasn't her fault. I'm like, oh, jeez. So I got off the ladder, I went inside, and I apologized to my wife. <laughs> but that is how you do it. He saw an offense. He saw that I offended. And so we say, but it says offend, if a brother is offended, anything that's not of Christ should offend us. Right? Because the Holy Spirit and Jesus lives in us. So anything that offends Christianity should offend us. So it didn't mean I needed to offend him. I just offended Christ and I offended my wife. And he saw it and called me out. That is a brother that loves another brother. And that's what we need to do for one another. And we not, it, Because the fact is we don't love each other if we're not going to come to each other and talk to each other about that. And so if they're not going to listen, now it says bring two men. And those two men that you bring are men in your church that have character. Men who aren't just going to side with you. You can take your buddies and go, hey, let's get this guy. But then all the stuff he was talking about earlier in the chapter isn't true, right? You don't have a pure heart that's seeking truth like a child. So you bring people who will tell you if you're wrong. Because it says bring a witness, there's a possibility that you are wrong, that I am wrong. And so when we, we want to bring these two other people to say, hey, decide between us. Let us know, you know who's wrong here because they might actually turn to you and go, hey, I know you brought this up, but you're actually the one at fault here. And if you have the right heart that you were trying to bring your brother back into the fold, you're going to go, wow, okay, thank you so much. I want to apologize right now to his brother. Now it's over. Other or... They're going to tell this, this guy, hey, you're at fault. You need to apologize here. And then if he won't do, do that, here's what it says. And if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he refuses even to hear the church, let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. So now you bring him to the church, and the church decides, and that's the pastors who have been put, put in that place, Rather than going to the outside world, going to, an, going to a judge, a secular judge, you bring him to the elders and the pastors of your church. And they, it, then if he still won't repent, and all these people have said, yes, you're in the wrong, now he has to leave your church. Because if he does, and you say, that might sound pretty harsh. Well, Paul said to that one guy who was sleeping with his father's 
um, wife, he said, hand him over, kick him out of the church and hand him over to Satan that his soul might be saved. If he remains in your church, he's going to be a cancer and he's going to cause division in that church. So you have to remove him from the church. And it says, so let's see what it says about treat him like a heathen and a tax collector. Turn to 1 Corinthians 5 real quick so that we're not confused about what it means. 1 Corinthians 5, we're going to go in verse 9. Paul writing, he said, I wrote to you in my epistle not to keep company with sexually immoral people. Yet I certainly did not mean with the sexually immoral people of this world or with the covetous or extortioners or idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world. But now I have written to you not to keep company with anyone named a brother who is sexually immoral or covetous or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or an extortioner, not even to eat with such a person. For what have I to do with judging those also who are outside? Do you not judge those who are inside? But those who are outside, God judges. Therefore, put away from yourself the evil person. So he's saying, kick him out. You have to if you've gone to him. Another thing to talk about on this is when we're dealing with church and church discipline. I'll tell you, I've had to take this all the way to step four one time in my life. In 30 years of serving Christ, one time in my life, I had to take, we had to take a gentleman all the way through. And he didn't repent and he had to leave the church. And it was the hardest thing I ever did in my life. So much so that just a month ago, I was still fretting about it. I was in a, in a bad place going, Lord, is, are we making any difference in our world right now? Why is nothing changing for the better? And I was just down and I'm like, and I thought of this young man and I'm like, did we even do, did we even do that right? Is he out in the world and just, living for Satan and it's our fault. And I specifically thought of the man we had to do that to 20 years. It was 20 years ago we did this. And so I'm in a place I shouldn't have been, I, I, a place of lack of faith, just going, the, the world is just <coughs> going down fast and nothing's going to change it. Here's how awesome God is. That same week, I hadn't talked to that guy in 20 years. He called me and he said, I searched it out. I found your number because I wanted to tell you, thank God what you men did in my life because it caused me to turn to Christ. He goes, I, I didn't listen to you. I had a stiff neck. I went out in the world. I took the job you told me not to take. I did all the things you told me not to do and I lost my marriage because of it. But then came to a place where I knew God was God. Committed his life to the God. He runs a multi-million dollar business, his own business right now. And his wife and he are best friends. They're not reunited, but they're best friends. And they raise their children together. But he says, if it wasn't for that, I would have never turned to God. And I'm just, I was just blown away that God cared enough about me that even when I was in a bad place, he had that guy call me. How awesome is our God, right? And so that took me to a place of repentance, right? I am so sorry, God. I will do what you call me to do and leave the results up to you, right? And that's what we're called to do. And so we've ran out of time. So let me leave you with this. To have unity in the church, we have to be like little children. We have to have a pure heart that says, I want my brother in heaven with me. And I don't want to rule over him. I don't want to be the greatest in heaven. I want to be the one that's out there seeking the lost so that they get to go to heaven like I get to go. And if we're not doing that, and if we're setting bad examples for children, let's change that in our lives right now and say, Lord, fill me with your Holy Spirit that I care as much about that one lost sheep as you do. And I'll do something about it. Amen? Lord, we just come before you and we thank you for our time together. And I pray, Lord, that you just allow us by the power of your Holy Spirit to be running after that one lost sheep everywhere we go, in our communities, in our neighborhoods, in our workplace, in our families, Lord, that the urgency would be upon us to lead people to you and that you would allow them to come to you and find salvation in your name alone. 
Lord, help us not to be about us and to be just the opposite, to be humble as a little child, to be pure of heart as a little child, and to be able to live a life that we can say to the children around us, follow Christ exactly how I do it. Thank you for that opportunity. Thank you that you use us with the messed up people we are. It's so amazing, Lord, that you use us for your work. And we just thank you and praise you for it. And we love you and praise you and give you all the glory and praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.